we're going to look at some, uh, some DDD stuff, technically. Um, my name is Pim. I work at Procurios. If you want to know more about Procurios, you can check out developer.procurios.com. If you want to know more about me, then I'm on Twitter. And that's about it. Not really much else on me. What we're going to do today, I'm expecting most of you are already familiar with this part of DDD, with all this stuff here. That's all DDD. Don't be fooled, however. This part here is not DDD. Don't be fooled. Um, this, I'm assuming most of you have not as much familiarity with, with this part here that to the keen observer, you've already seen, it's actually the same as this part here. Um, but there's also all this other stuff here. Uh, that's also DDD, uh, but it's different DDD. It's not the same DDD. Questions? <laughs> what are we going to do today? We're, yeah. We're going to look at DDD. DDD stands for Domain Driven Design. Who had never heard of DDD before? T today, I guess? OK, a couple of you. Who have heard of DDD, but have not really done much with it? Oh, that's excellent. Oh, we're going to do fun stuff today. Good. Um, good. So what we're, what we're going to do today is I want to give you an approach on doing something with DDD, but not the whole thing, because even though I kind of joked over it, the overviews that I showed you, that's actually an overview of DDD. It, that's, it's, it's pretty big. There's a couple of books on DDD. There's a big blue book that was originally written on DDD, and the people thought, you know, this is a really complicated book. It's a really complex book. So let's write a book to explain that book. And then the guy who wrote that book thought, no, this is still a really difficult book. I'll write another book to explain the book to explain the book. And uh, it's uh, 20 years later, and we're still giving conference talks on, hey, what is all this DDD stuff about? So what is all this DDD stuff about? Well, today, I'm not going to do DDD with you. We're going to do technically DDD. We're going to look at some of the technical patterns of DDD. And I want to give you an approach, something that you can start using right away without having to dive into it. Something that you can start using today. But first, first, we're going to do a little bit of context, a little bit of what's all this stuff about. How many of you would consider themselves object-oriented programmers. We need, yeah, who, who, who doesn't? Well, yeah, there are still people who don't do object orientation, maybe do functional programming, maybe don't do object orientation. Um, I went to university in Nijmegen here in the Netherlands. I went to the Radboud Universiteit. And um, out of five years, out of 10 semesters, one-sixth of one semester was spent on object orientation. I had functional data structures, I've had algorithms, I've had foundations, I had semester after semester of math, but only one-sixth of one semester on object orientation. So when I got out of school, I didn't have much respect for object orientation. In fact, when I got to work, I almost immediately had the audacious thought, that I kind of knew everything that I was to know about object orientation. Pretty arrogant, but you know, that's what happens. You can't control your thoughts that much. So I thought I was keen on object orientation. I thought I knew what there was to know. But I had this nagging, lingering thought in my mind. Maybe you've had the thought as well. How do I know if my object-oriented design is any good? How do I know that when I've created this architecture, how do I know if it's good? Maybe you've heard of Solid. Has anyone heard of Solid? Oh, that's more than I expected. Really good. So if you haven't heard of Solid, it's fine. Don't bother. Uh, or bother, but not now. <laughs> Solid is a, a set of patterns, of principles, that you can use to evaluate if your code maybe can be better. But if Solid says, well, well, your code couldn't be better, that doesn't mean it's good. It just means it's not bad. So how do you know if the design that you made is any good? Well, that's where domain-driven design comes in. Domain-driven design gives us a set of tools and techniques, tactical and strategical patterns that you can apply to discovering the domain of your customer. Domain. You have an 
idea of what that word means, domain, it means that the world of your customer, the language they use, the things that they talk about, that's what drives how our code will look. Not our technical jargon, but their functional jargon, so to say. Now, there's a lot of techniques in domain-driven design that will help you discover all that, but I'm going to assume most of you are not going to just change your organizational structure, suddenly have access to all these people that you should be talking to. So today, we're not going to do that. Today, we are just going to say, just going to see code. We're just going to look at some code and what could you do to make that code a little bit better, to make that code align with your customer's domain, or at least for as far as you know it. So we're going to start with some technical building blocks. And maybe you've heard of some of these. I'm assuming most of you have had some information. Oh, that's the wrong button. I apologize. On this one, value objects. Who's heard of value objects? Yes, good. What is a value object? Does anyone dare to give this definition? Yeah? Immutable and without identity? Yeah, bonus points. There is another thing to value objects, though. Very technical of you. So people would say that's not what domain-driven design is about. But you are correct. Yes, a value object also always has valid state. Value objects are part of a strategy called make the incorrect inexpressible. Whatever is not OK should not into memory. There's one more thing about value objects that is the result of this statement. Value objects define the range of allowed values for a certain value type, I guess. Let's look at an example. Who here has a name? <laughs> Not many of you. OK, interesting, <laughs> interesting. So here is a possible representation of a name. Apparently, for whatever system this name was created, this is sufficiently a definition for what a name is. This name has a last name, first name, and insertion. Most Dutch names will fit somewhere into this. Now, there's something interesting about this solution, and it has to do with what the gentleman before said. There is a business rule in this value object. Can you spot it? There is a business rule that says a name must have a last name. Now, if you feed this constructor an invalid last name, which can be seen here, in PHP we can do this stuff, which is kind of nice, then immediately we say, well, this is an invalid name because last name is missing. We throw an exception. That means the constructor cannot finish its work, which means this object cannot come into memory. This business rule makes sure that there is no possibility at all that there can be an object of this type into memory. The incorrect is inexpressible. Let's look at another example. Email address. Email address validation is always one of those fun topics. Here we see a maybe less interesting value object. It doesn't have more attributes than just its singular email address. But it has another business rule. It says that if we want to have an object of type email address, we have to have a valid email address that, of course, we validate with a record. Oh, no, not with a regex. By the way, if, if anyone ever really does this, if you want to validate an email, just send an email there. But again, we have here a value object that makes sure that the incorrect is inexpressible. Why do we want this? We want this because all the other parts of our system, which shouldn't be too many, that depend on this value object don't have to think about it. It's valid. The problem is isolate. So value objects, to summarize, value objects express 
a value, yeah, okay, sure, but they also define the range of allowed values. Value objects are immutable, and as a result of all that, they are easy to test. Why are they easy to test? They require no setup. You cannot change the state, exactly. So value objects, clear for everyone? If anyone has any questions, feel free to interrupt me because we're only going to speed up. All right. What would come next? Oh, 10 points to Gryffindor. Entities. What is an entity? Do you, there? Yes. Yes, very good. Lifetime or path. So an entity is most specifically not something that you can save and load with to an, from a database. You know, Doctrine uses words like entity. Uh, for the instance of ORMs, that's valid in, in that use case. But in the domain of domain-driven design, entity means something that has an identity, a path, a life cycle, and that has interesting interaction with the domain. Elsewise, we wouldn't be interested in it. So, for example, something like this an attendee, and an attendee has an identity, a name and an email address. Conspicuously missing business rules. We had all these previously examples that said make the incorrect inexpressible and now there's no business rules. Or are there? We cannot construct this entity without valid value objects and valid value objects require valid state cannot be incorrect, the incorrect is inexpressible, and as such, this entity can only be expressed through valid value objects. Without valid value objects, this entity cannot exist. If you're doing PHP. Because PHP is explicit about whether null is an allowed value. Yes, if you do this in Java, then you have to have business rules saying can't be null. Ugh. Go for PHP. So entities, well, not a whole lot of interesting interaction with the domain in this one. Perhaps we shall see if we do encounter one. Entities have an identity. They have a path, they evolve over time, stuff happens to them. And entities are slightly harder to test. Why would entities be harder to test? Because they can change state. Yeah, that's exactly their intention. So that means that if you want to test, then sometimes your setup will be a little bit more difficult. If this has happened, and this has happened, and this has happened, then when something else happens, we expect, yeah, okay. Entities, questions about entities? Not very exciting yet, is it? It's boring theory. Let's do another one. Services. What's a service? If you had ever had a customer that talks about a thing, but it's not a thing, but they talk about it as if it's a thing, oh yeah, or invoicing, oh yeah, the registration, there's all this stuff that they keep talking about, like processes that they keep talking about that aren't really a thing, but they talk about it as if it's a thing. Services don't have an identity, don't have a life cycle, don't have I guess you could say interesting interaction out of themselves. They're not a thing, but they cover a business process that perhaps is like cross-cutting concerns. Concern maybe more than one entity or more information than a single entity would know about. Stuff like that. So for example, something like, yes, there we go. Something like a registration. Say we have a business rule that says, well, it's okay if attendees register but we don't want attendees to register twice, they have to be unique. Well, that's a lot of information if we would have to have all the email address of the system in one entity. So because this information is too much for a single entity to know, we require something else to cover this for us, something that has access to that information. Now this something has that burden how do you say that? Delegated? Delegated to a repository? Well, that's fine. As long as this is the object that's responsible for making sure this business rule is validated. That's the role that a service plays. 
A service makes sure that business rules are validated, that things are happening that are too big for a single entity to know about. So why would services be even harder to test than entities? Because they require even more setup. They require an entity to be set up, at least, perhaps two, perhaps more. All kinds of stuff can have happened, and if you implement the previous one, you're also going to need mocking. So services, slightly harder to test even than entities. Now, one more I want to mention. I don't really want to talk about repositories, but we had it in the previous slide, so I have to mention it. I don't really want to talk about it because we're not going to be using it, but yeah. What in the domain of domain-driven design is a repository? Does anyone have a guess or no? Yes. Yes, that's exactly what it is in Doctree. <laughs> So in the domain of object relational mapping, that's what a repository is. In the domain of domain-driven design, a repository is an object that is responsible for the collection of all or almost all objects, entities of a given type. And that's all I want to say about repositories. So that was, that was it for the theory. That was already it. Let's uh, skip to something fun. Let's do a quiz. Who, like, who doesn't like quizzes? We have our final class, address. Is that a value, object, entity, or service? Or repository? Hint, it's not a repository. <laughs> value object. Anyone else? Value object, service, entity? It's obviously an entity, an address, like a public speech, like something you prepare and then you give it and then you collect feedback and improve it. So obviously, an entity has interesting life cycle. Uh, what about bicycle service? Class bicycle service. Value object, entity, or service? Service, entity? It's obviously a value object. It's just something that you agree upon with your bike repairman and then forget about it. So, What about street address? Come on, this one's easy. Value object, entity, service. Value object, yeah, yeah. That's obviously an entity. Uh, does anyone know what the cadaster is? <laughs> in the, the Netherlands, addresses are registered through a governmental organization called the cadaster. It's responsible for managing addresses. So when a new street is created, then the addresses on that street have to be maintained. And you know, 60 years later, the street gets demolished. And so the addresses have to leave the system. So obviously, lots of interesting interaction. What about investment? Value object, entity, service? It's a repository. Certain. Certain. Absolutely. Ten points. <laughs> yeah, by now. I think a gentleman over there already got it at the start. You knew too much. You knew. Uh, you can just tell by the name whether it's a value object, entity, or service. Whether something is a value object or entity or service depends on... I hate to say that, but at least I've got a follow-up on that. It depends on your domain. It depends on how it will play its role in your software. So investment is a special one for me because it's the investment is the one that I found this out even before I knew about domain driven design. We have a customer, they do social investment banking. It's a really cool project, really cool customer. They invest in third world countries and um, so what you can do is you can invest that means you do an investment, as they talk about it, and that's just a registration of an event. And events are value objects. But of course, your investment after that gets tracked and you know it grows with every investment you do, and that is, of course, an entity. But then, of course, you also have all the investments you do over all your accounts because you can invest into different regions and all that stuff, and all that combined they talk about is investment. So basically, Whatever Zoom level you choose for their organization, there's at least one definition of investment that matches that Zoom level. Very tiring project. No, it was a really cool project. Very harsh lessons, though. So naming. Naming is important. Naming can be confusing, especially if you have access to your customers. Slow down. Slow down and be sure, very sure, about what words mean. because. Their words is what leads our programming, what drives our design, not ours. So let's do 
some code, some actual code. Let's do at a case study. I'm particularly fond of this domain. I've been working uh, in this domain for some time. And uh, I also started <laughs> speaking, uh, which means I have even more to do with this domain, the domain of meetings, meetups. Having a certain get together with people at a certain time and place with a certain program or something like that. And uh, this is what we would call an anemic model. Does that word mean something to you? Anemic model. A model that has all kinds of attributes and no interaction. You could easily save and load this to a database, but it doesn't do a whole lot for us. And it certainly does not make the incorrect inexpressible. Now let's imagine that there is a fictional company that has code like this. And they get all kinds of tickets. And as a result of those tickets, we get tasked to implement whatever was in the ticket and make it a little bit better. So uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is how one of those objects could come into memory. Take a look at how that program is created. Uh, does anyone still do PHP stuff like this? Yeah, it happens. It's OK. No shaming. Uh, I'm actually going to provide you with an approach not to do that anymore, so who knows. Um, I used to do a lot of this at work, um, certainly my coworkers too. So we have plenty of opportunity to make things better. So what are we going to do? Well, we're not going to touch it. Yeah, until we get a request for a change or a new feature, we're not going to touch this. It doesn't matter if it's legacy. Uh, if we don't pay rent, then it's fine. Uh, uh, ah, ah, shit. <laughs> Well, there we go. Meetings cannot end before they start. That's a very sane request, isn't it? You can imagine the kind of tickets that led to this feature request. Meetings cannot end before they start. So how are we going to tackle this? Oh, that echoes. Um, well, this is the time where we talk about the approach. The approach that I want to send you home with. It is patented, so keep it to yourselves. Um, what we're going to do, we are going to um, focus on shipping. Shipping. We want to make sure that, you know, because otherwise you have these difficult conversations with your manager, like, oh, I want to make this better. And they're like, no, no, no. <laughs> OK, fine, fine, fine. We're just going to do it really well. And then if there's time left, we'll make it better. So we're going to focus on keeping our code shippable. But if there's time, we'll make it better. So what we'll do, we'll, we'll just implement it. We'll just implement this business rule as stupid as we can. And then we'll extract a sensible value object from our entity. And if there's still time, we'll refactor our value object to make it better. I present you the approach. Implement it in entity, extract value object, and then refactor the value object to make things better. So the first step would be to implement it. We're not going to go through this on a very, very, very fine detail. I'm just going to show you the steps. So the first step would be, as you have seen before, to put the business rule in the constructor. Make sure that it has a name that tells other programmers what we're doing, because we're communicating to other programmers. The machine will follow. And then we are going to implement the business rule with whatever we have. And what we have is stupid, but it is what we have. And you see this, this, again, this approach, we throw an exception whenever we encounter a situation that is incorrect. And we ship it. And the manager's happy. And we're happy. Uh, are we happy? Ah, we're not happy. And if we have time left, then we can make it better. So what was the second step? It's a value object. Yes, exactly. It's a value object. We extract a value object. So what we will be doing is we will replace whatever was sent into this object, which were four strings, with one sensible value object called, well, it's in my naming, meeting duration. I get a lot of criticism for naming it meeting duration, so I just leave it in there. <laughs> uh, you could have another sensible name for this, like whatever signals in your uh, um, in your context correctly that it is a time from until something like that. I, I'm still happy with duration. Um, so what do we do? We take all the properties and the rule and send it to that value object, which would look like this. 
It's not very exciting, but it is what it is. Second step done, we have our value object, and again, we can ship it. The rule is satisfied, so the business value is there. But we're still not happy with this, of course. What will be the next step to make this better, to truly refactor this? Anyone have a suggestion? Ooh, another 10 points. That's 20 points for you, 10 points for you, and the rest of you are lagging behind. Get in the game! So yes, let's use daytime immutable. Why daytime immutable? Yeah, this question was not as hard as I imagined. <laughs> so five points for you. Five points for you. Yes, let's use what PHP provided for us. Now, I don't know if you've ever worked with date and time in other programming languages. You know, everybody has their criticism. I certainly have my criticism on daytime and daytime immutable. But I'm still pretty happy with those. Thank you, Derek. So yes, we have implemented it, we have extracted, we have refactored. I'm happy. Are you happy? No. Yeah. Good. That's what I was aiming for. So this is how we would now construct our entity. Yeah. It's a little bit more complex than it was before, but we have the added benefit of making the incorrect inexpressible, which I personally like very much. Let's do another one. Uh, questions? Good. So, what could we do next? Program slots cannot occur in the same room at the same time. Boy, that would be awkward. Everybody would have to share a seat. Two speakers talking at the same time. So let's figure out, what can we do to make this happen? What's the first thing we do? The first thing we do, implement the rule in the entity. So that could look something like this. Now this is kind of a hard rule, so feast your eyes, take your time to oh, first see what the program was like. I forgot my own slide. Convenience for you. We have our date, start time, end time, uh, title, and room. So what would it mean for program slots to overlap, be in the same room at the same time? So our rule could look something like this. We have a nice double for each, checking a few things, and if we fall through, then we throw a nice exception. And again, the incorrect is inexpressible. I also particularly like this formatting, this way of throwing exceptions. I stole it from Jeroen van der Gulik from Noxy. Uh, I really like, uh, like this style. Um, now you, of course, would write unit tests. But for now, I'm just going to have you assume that this works. And we can ship it. And we're happy. Well, the manager's happy. We're not happy. We want to take our time for the second step, which is to extract a value object. We implemented an entity, then we extract a value object. Now, there's not a whole lot of properties that come with this business rule. It's just program. So we are going to take program, we are going to take this rule, and we are going to create a value object. That would leave our entity looking like this. Instead of an array of program, we would have a sensibly named value object going in there and the entity would be happy again. But we would have a very ugly program with nothing but an array in there and the business rule. But it's better. We can ship it. Or we could spend some more time refactoring. What would you suggest would be a nice step to refactor this? Hmm. Very interesting. Perhaps, maybe it will come on another slide, but the first thing we do is another DDD thing that I uh, like, another uh, one of those expressions. Make the incorrect inexpressible, really good. Another one I really like is make the implicit explicit. So there is an implicit object wanting to come out with properties, so let's make it so. And that would look something like this. So instead of having an array of arrays, we would have an array of program slots. And we could loop over that array as we did before. But instead of answering the questions, we ask this slot if it overlaps with.
oh, sorry, it's tell, don't ask. I thought it was yell, don't ask. We tell, don't ask. We don't get all the information and then decide. We just say, well, you decide. You figure out what it means for you and this other slot to overlap. And I also really like this approach of this and that. Sometimes it's a bit hard to autocomplete, but it's very explicit. Um, and what would that overlapping, again, what would that look like? Well, that would look something like this. And that's pretty nice. That's much better than what this was before. And you even see that I reused meeting duration. So whoever suggested that, I, you did? Yeah, well, can't really do anything else than give you 10 points, which means you overtake. So overlaps with. What's funny about this, what I really, really, really like about this approach is instead of having a piece of executable code that does what it's supposed to do, we actually have a nice hierarchy of meaning here. What does it mean for the program, as we saw here on this previous slide, what does it mean for the program to have this business rule of program slots cannot occur in the same room at the same time. What does that mean? Well, it means that we have program slots and make sure that none of them overlaps with. Okay, what does that mean? Well, that means that they're not in the same room and that the durations don't overlap. That's really nice. We're communicating powerful messages here by layering them. I really appreciate that. Now, of course, we keep kicking the can down the road. What does it mean for two durations to overlap? Well, that, oh. Ooh, I see people yawning. Yeah, this isn't pretty. But, it, I mean, we have tests, so we know it works, right? That's the thing about refactoring. You change the internal coding without changing its external behavior. So we know this works. But it's rough on the eyes. And it doesn't communicate meaning. And we, like, we want to communicate meaning. So what does this mean? Well, it means that the start and the... Um, um, OK, how about this? If this duration contains the start of the other, or that co duration contains the start of the end of the... <sighs> I'm still having a hard time. You guys have a hard time? I still think this is pretty hard. Can we, can, we, can we find another way here? So what we're doing here. So let's, let's think out the, outside of the box. So we have two durations here. We have our one duration, and we want to know if it, if it overlaps with the other. So we want to know this. Can everybody kind of see? We want to know this, or this, or this or this, or we could say what we don't want is this or this. What would that look like? Oh, oh yes, that's much better. Uh, okay, but again, communicate meaning. So what does this mean? Well, this means that this isn't before that and that isn't before this. Yes. Now, isn't that nice? Isn't that nice? And we're done, we can ship. Except there's two bugs. Bonus point if you spot the bugs. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Oh, that's very smart of you, indeed. See, what's interesting, mathematically, and as a programmer, I am very interested in math, as a mathematician, this is correct. This is what it means for a thing to be before another thing. But in the domain of meetings, this is perfectly fine to have one meeting end at 10 and have another begin at 10. That's fine. So in this domain, this is not what before is. And we have to have our customer's domain drive our code, drive our design, drive our naming. So yes. We should definitely change that to a with a dog f um, greater than or equals yes. But there's another bug. 50 points, who spots the bug? Take a minute. I'll wait. I've got all day. 
Uh, it's, it's really hard. And I'm really, really happy that that gentleman suggested it, because elsewise it would be purely my fabrication and not your fault. But as a collective audience, you're all to blame now. This meeting duration class, we reused it because it was convenient, because it seemed to play the same role. But there is something interesting. There's a hidden rule here. Date? What? Who? Yeah. Program slots, for whatever reason, we don't know, don't cross midnight. Now, that may be a bug. It may be intentional. If any one of you is an avid reader of Matthias Novak's blog, he actually posted an article earlier this week on how much should you read into what the code is currently doing. So it's his opinion that maybe you should allow this to be changed. But I don't know. And I'm going for the safe option, which would be to keep the same behavior. And so instead of having our program slot use meeting duration, we're going to have our program slot use their own duration, which has different business rules. So we would have our slot duration, which would be very similar to our meeting duration, except with an added business rule of slots must start and end on the same day, and with our correct implementation of what before means, because that's what it means in this domain. And the tests are succeeding, and we didn't break anything, we didn't break any existing paradigms, and we're happy, because we took some time to refactor. But we never lost track of shipping, and we made the incorrect inexpressible. So this is what it would look like in the very first situation to create a meeting. And this is what we end up with. It's a little bit more layered. We have some rules in there that have their own place in this application. And we can ship it. And we're done. Done, done. So I hope you have some idea now of what you can do. Implement an entity, extract value object, and then refactor the value object to make the incorrect inexpressible. Thank you very much. If you want to have the slides, they are online. You can find them there. Uh, if you would like to rate my talk, I would be very happy. I will be tweeting this stuff out. You don't have to take a picture. Um, and if anyone has any questions or scathing comments, I will be more than happy to receive them. Yes, gentleman yeah. up front. A question I uh, just came up is, in the slide you showed the investment and the project you worked on, how did you solve the problem that the same word means different things in different contexts? Uh, I had a similar thing, and I solved it by prefixing the name with something else, but that was very ugly. So how would you solve something like this? So how would we solve it if we have, from the domain, the same word meaning different things in different contexts. Well, there is two approaches that you can take that I am readily aware of. Uh, the first would be indeed to have different contexts and to have, you know, just by namespace, for example, having them mean different things. Sometimes that's hard on the autocomplete. Or by having it prefixed with what it means in that context, not ideal. Uh, another thing that is possible if you have access to your customer, is to keep talking to them. Because they have this issue too, onboarding new members, for uh, new uh, colleagues, for example. Oh, no, 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 that's not what we mean by investment here. This is what we mean by investment here. And here it means this. It's their problem too. So working together, there are some opportunities to help the both of you. But you always have to wrap it up as if you're helping them, but secretly you're helping you. Yes. Do I use Symphony in my projects? 
Um, no, not often. Sometimes in my hobby projects. Um, Why? Uh, well, when someone asks, uh, do you have any you know, new systems for open source or open source? Yes. Like yes. Yes. Nonsense. <laughs> so the gentleman. Yeah. So um, the gentleman asks, uh, "Are are uh, what can you do uh, to have uh, the convenience of a framework such as Symfony and still have some of the rigor of domain-driven design? Is that a good interpretation of your question?" So there are a couple of things that you can do with that. First off, I would recommend that if you work on smaller projects or whatever, whatever, and I shouldn't be saying this because speakers shouldn't be nuanced, speakers should just kick the bucket. No, no, that's not what I mean. Uh, but speakers should be very firm. Um, if you have the opportunity to make rapid application development and not pay the price of having rapid application development, then do it by all means, but you are going to read code much more often than you're going to write code, yada, yada, yada. So if you have the opportunity to do the rigor of DDD for bigger projects or long-term projects, that's always better. But there are a couple of things you can do to still use Symfony and use DDD. So having, for example, uh, a mapper between your DDD entities and your doctrine entities is one thing. Uh, I don't know how easy it is to write symphony forms that produce command objects instead of ready right into the network of, of entities. So the, the problem of making the incorrect inexpressible is not so much in the object itself, but in the way it's used in the system. So if you have an interface that's fine and good, where the rest of the system relies on, then the implementation doesn't matter as much. As long as the rest of the system doesn't know about the getters, so those are two solutions that you could use, three solutions you could, uh, you could use. You could map, you could use uh, CQS, uh, qu command query separation, or you could have uh, interfaces that hide the implementation, that hide the fact that your DDD entity is also a doctrine entity. Good luck. Any other questions? Yes. What's the downside of domain-driven design? Uh, the downside is you have to talk to people and understand people. I don't, I don't believe, but this is my opinion, I don't believe there is a downside to using proper value objects. How many people here in your, uh, well, how many people in the audience would say that a significant amount of their errors, say a third, come from inconsistent state? We actually know. Uh, uh, out of our, um, out of our, uh, uh, all the like, we have uh, something like 1,300 unique error cases uh, over six months of three million lines of code. Out of those 1,300 error cases, 700 are null pointer exceptions and 600 are in invalid state. So we we know what doing proper domain driven design would save us. It would save us 600. It would it would save us almost 50 percent of our errors. But it would take some time to get it together, I think. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I only do domain-driven design these days. I don't do the whole array stuff anymore. Does that answer your question? Yeah, ish. We'll talk more about it if you, uh, if you like. Yes. By the way, it's time. So if anyone wants to go, just feel free to. Uh... Yes. Um, one of my uh, business will change. Uh, so if I like, have already data stored in my database, and now my business will change, so I mm. uh, use that has to have a phone number or something, and Yeah. And um, if I would follow um, this is a project and I can be uh, making expressible to don't have a phone number, I yeah. would not be able to create a proper objects out of what is in the database. Yes. So how do I tackle this? So um, the gentleman asks, I have inconsistent data in my database with what the rules now are because the rules changed. How do I deal with this? Does anyone else have a question? <laughs> <laughs> So there are a couple of approaches here as well. It's a difficult question for sure, because um, you want to make the incorrect inexpressible, but you can't read. So you could have several versions of your entity's 
lying about because these these rules are entity level. You, your customer should have this this valid phone number. Mm -hmm -hmm. So you could say I have a set of customers without phone number and a set of customers with phone number and have a migration strategy to either getting those phone numbers and complying to GDPR or just not complying to GDPR and not doing business in Europe anymore. <laughs> Otherwise, um, you could have, uh, probably not for phone numbers, but maybe for some kind of other data, you could have a default or a fallback or something else. Or say, for example, uh, when we moved from uh, bank accounts to IBAN, and you also need BIC, so for 95% of our customers, we could find the BIC number ourselves. So that was a very easy migration, and we could, for the customers for which we did not have a BIC, choose some alternate approach. But so it kind of depends on, on how much, um, on, on how many of your uh, interesting objects would violate the new rules. But uh, talk to your management about this. I think I really have to stop right now. Yeah. So thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your conference.